are on our way to the promised land, which is metaphorically that state of being where we are just vibrating. We are connected through the heart to all that is. And we are not in a state of lack. That's what we're all here evolving toward. But for most of us, it's not our starting point and it's not our current residence. All that we visit, we visit there, but we don't live there yet. Today we are celebrating the Feast of Passover, um, which is actually happening on Saturday coming up, but we're talking about it today. Passover is, is the key story of the Jewish people. It's their most important story. But it's a universal story that we all experience. It's a story about how we go from being enslaved to getting ourselves out of slavery. That's what the story is about. And all the challenges that are involved in that process for us. Just any sacred story, you can, you can interpret it on many levels. So just for the bare bones of the story, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, Moses is a character who was actually um, born and is Israelite. And at a time when uh, Pharaoh had decided to slaughter all the male babies, he was um, rescued and escaped that fate. So he grew up a life of privilege in Egypt, raised by the Pharaoh's daughter. And at one point, he saw some other Israelites being mistreated <clears throat> because they were slaves in large numbers in Egypt. And he got mad and he killed the guy who was mistreating them. And he thought he could just get away with that. But then the next person that was doing that, he starts yelling and he must have had a little temper issue. Anyway, he, um, the guys that he's yelling at say, oh, you going to kill us like you killed that other guy? And then he realized, oops, somebody saw that. He didn't know that. And so he, he escapes. And he goes to another country where he gets, <clears throat> he gets married, and it's, it's like, have you ever made that move of, oh, this isn't working, I'll just put the past behind me, and you walk away from it, and it's like, no, there was no past, I'm not thinking about it, but it catches up with you, you know, like you divorce that guy, and then you get married, and it's like, I thought I got rid of that guy, you know, here he is again, <laughs> whatever it is, those problems just keep following you until you deal with them. So he, he goes away to this other land, and then he gets the call from God. It's called the story of the burning bush. And this bush is on fire, and it's really code for a mystical experience he has, where he, he gets this calling from the divine to do something about something that he perceives as wrong in the world that he's supposed to be an instrument of freeing his people from Egypt. So he doesn't want to do that. He argues with God mightily, but doesn't win, and ends up going to Pharaoh, facing Pharaoh, and saying, let my people go. Pharaoh, of course, says no. And so he starts threatening and delivering on the threats with 10 plagues one worse than the next. So the rivers turn to blood, the frogs are infesting the land, there's locusts everywhere, there's, you know, you name it, there's horrible things happening. None of this persuades Pharaoh to let them go until the final thing is the firstborn child of every Egyptian is killed. The, the Jews are spared from this because they have followed instructions, they have slaughtered a goat or a lamb, and they've smeared the blood on the, the door so that the angel of death knows that there's an Israelite living there and skips over them, 
passes over them. And, and so then, once that happens, Pharaoh is furious. He's had enough. He says, get them out of here. They're more trouble than they're worth. And so all these millions are starting to escape. And then Pharaoh thinks again. And he says, well, maybe not. And so he comes after them with his army. And then, according to Cecil B. DeMille at least, the waters part in massive fashion. And the Israelites make it through. And then as the Israelites, I mean, as the Egyptians um, pursue them, the waters close over them and they are all drowned and the Israelites have escaped. And now they get to spend 40, days wander, 40 years wandering in the desert. Um, so that, but that's another story. That's not part of the Passover. So that's, that's the bare bones of the story. Like all sacred stories, you can interpret this on so many levels. One, one of the levels is to say, well, why did the Israelites think that was such an important story? Not what do we think it means, but what did they think it means? Why do they tell it over and over again? What was important about it? And the answer is that this was their reassurance that no matter what predicament they were in, God was with them, and God would deliver them from it. It was not it was not written as a biography at the moment that it was happening. It was written hundreds of years later when they were yet again in captivity. And it was to remind them to have hope in this circumstance. So that's why they told the story. But for us, the real richness comes in looking at this from a metaphysical point of view. So, first of all, Egypt represents the material conditions. And Pharaoh is like the rational mind that rules over the material world, that sees what's happening there and makes decisions about it. We all live in a material world. And we are more than that. So Moses comes along, and we have an inner Moses, who is perhaps a reluctant hero, but sees ways that we are enslaved by the Pharaoh, which is our thinking. How is it that we are stuck in a circumstance where we do not feel free, because we were born to be free? And we need to do something about it. And so we call upon our inner Moses. Moses has power. He doesn't always think he has power. But he has power only because he is aligned with the Lord God Yahweh. Which is available to all of us. So let's think about this in terms of some circumstances. I know a, a good friend of mine has been in a situation, or was in a situation, for many, many years, like over a dozen years, where she was experiencing abuse from a partner. And she knew that this was not a good thing. She knew she did not deserve this. But her thinking kept her enslaved, because she kept making excuses for herself for why she would stay in this. She kept making excuses for the man that who, who was doing the abuse. And it went on longer and longer and longer than it ever should have, should have. Until one day, she finally was able to get her inner Moses into action and say, I'm done. This is it. She called the police. How many of us have been in a situation where we let it go on too long and then there is something, there's that moment like the slaughter of the firstborn in Egypt. There's that moment where it's like, I'm done. 
I am not going to put up with this any longer. I remember in my previous marriage, when I look back at it, I ask myself, why did I put up with that for so long? It wasn't physical abuse, and so it was harder to pinpoint it. But, but when you step away and you look at it, when you have some distance, you think, oh my gosh, I've been telling myself this story of it was, it was good. And I realized, no, it was not good for a long, long time. But my thinking, the Pharaoh in me, had made excuses. And then there was a, <clears throat> a moment where something happened. And for me, it was the last straw. And I said, done. Done. What is your moment? Where have you been enslaved? Or perhaps you are still being enslaved. What is it that you need if you are? How drastic does it have to get before you say, done? Because we were not born to be slaves. I have another friend who told me about she has, she has struggled mightily with finances <clears throat> and tried so many different things. And no matter what she tries, she remains financially enslaved. She cannot manage to experience freedom. And finally she got to the point where she had to declare bankruptcy. And it was, it was a terrible experience for her, but in that moment, she suddenly got, oh, look what I've been doing with my thinking. She, she recognized the patterns in her thinking that had allowed these circumstances to continue. There was, not, there was no reason why she could not have had jobs that allowed her to flourish, but she did not. She did not. Every time something would happen. And she got, it's like what Lynn was saying with the victim thinking. She suddenly got the thinking that was at the base of her struggle. And when she got that, she was able to make a change in her life. The Moses in her was able to lead her out of that slavery with the power of the Most High. That is always available to all of us. But we don't take advantage of it because we are stuck in victim thinking. And that victim thinking has got very long roots to it. It's like those dandelions, if you've ever tried to pull them out of your yard. They have long roots. They go back into, into our childhood and the things that we have been told, like Lynn was talking about. We've been told things that are not true, but we have believed them because we were little. And we were impressionable. When children are small, they're, they're in a state of hypnosis. And those things that we tell them are going in. And if, if we are not in a place where we are centered when we tell those things, then we say things that are harmful. And they take them in. And that happened to all of us. <coughs> but, that doesn't make us victims. Yes, on one level, we are victims. But we are here, we are here in this world to become free. And you don't become free. You don't discover the wholeness of who you are if you start out that way. Because then it's like, yeah, yeah, of course. No, we are here on this great exodus as a people, 
We are here to look the material conditions in the face and say, you are not the boss of me. <laughs> we are here to do that. But in the beginning, it appears that that's true. It appears that the people who hate us or who persecute us or who refuse us what we need or physically hurt us, it appears that those people have authority over us. They are ruling us. They are our pharaoh until we realize we give them that authority. Until we activate the Moses in us and we t lead ourselves out of Egypt. And that's what we're here to do. It's not easy. And we go through many, all those plagues, metaphysically, there are all those things that, that happen, those signs. You know, you know how afterwards you say, oh, there were so many red flags. You know, how many have got like a closet full of red flags? <laughs> yeah, we, we have this hint that maybe this is not okay. But Pharaoh says, it'll be fine. It will be fine. And we ignore it. And then even after all of that piles up, and we have that last moment, and we're ready to go, we head out, and then here's the Red Sea in front of us. Here's the Pharaoh that's saying, wait, 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 that wants to take us back. And we hesitate. We hesitate because there, at the Red Sea, we are faced with the waters of the unknown. We are faced with, I don't know how to get through this. We are faced with that, and we are tempted to stay there so long that we end up getting trapped again. But if we call on the power of the Most High, that energy of life that has created the cosmos and created us and continues to create us in every moment. If we call upon that in those moments when we don't know how to go forward, something happens. The circumstances part. We have a way through. It always will happen. It may not look like we want it to look. It may not be comfortable. In Cecil B. DeMille's version, the water's completely parted, and now you're walking through on sand, right? And that's cool. Turns out it was a mistranslation. It's not the Red Sea, but the Reed Sea. So if it literally happened and is not metaphor, they're going through all kinds of weeds and muck. And how many of you like seaweed when you're in the ocean? Do you like having it all over you? You know, it's kind of yucky, isn't it? So, so you're going through, in the process of getting free, you're going through this yuck. And, and you don't have guarantees. Is there quicksand in there? Are you going to sink in that? There's no guarantee except the guarantee of your heart that is aligned with the divine. That says, I'm not a slave. I cannot die. I am always alive in all that is. I am that. I am bigger than this small life I've been living. There is something greater for me to be and to do. And I am going through whatever it is I have to go through in order to get there. I am here to be free. And nothing is going to stop me. So claim that for yourself. 
if you are invited to a Seder and you get to go, claim with the people who have invited you that we are here to be free. We are leaving behind. You eat the, the food that you eat in the Seder is the pack your bags and get moving food. We don't have time for anything else because we are here to claim the freedom that it, we were born for. We are here to radiate that freedom in the world, to lighten our world. That's why we are here, to be free.